Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody who is here in person in Washington, D.C. at the Save the Children office. And those of you dialing in from across, from across the world, I'm really excited to welcome everybody today to the Humanitarian Assistance Evidence Cycle, or HAAC, um, event on breaking down obstacles to impact evaluations in humanitarian settings. Uh, we have an estimated 50 to 60 people in the room here with a, a few hundred people dialing in online. We're really excited about the event today, and we really hope for you all to walk away at the end of the day with two clear uh, objectives met. The first is to understand the constraints that our sector faces to conducting impact evaluations in humanitarian context. And the second is to acknowledge the current evidence base and its associated gaps of rigorous impact evaluations of humanitarian programmings. This is also going to be how we will break the agenda of the day out. So we're gonna have a, a presentation uh, related to each of these objectives. And following that presentation, we'll have an opportunity to hear from a panel of experts on, on, that, on the content presented. So let me pause and give an overview of what the Humanitarian Assistance Evidence Cycle, or as we like to call it, HIAC, uh, is. So HIAC is an associate award that is underneath uh, the ideal activity, which is a leader with associates led by Save the Children. HIAC is a implemented by a consortium of partners, including Tango International, Causal Design, 3IE, and Save the Children. And really the, the purpose of HIAC is to demonstrate to the sector that impact evaluations can be completed in a cost-effective and timely manner, and that when used appropriately, they can in, that information can improve the efficiency and effectiveness of humanitarian awards. Really excited about the, the presenters and speakers we have today. In just a moment, we're going to hear from uh, Dr. Dean Carlin, uh, USAID's new chief economist. Um, and then we're going to have presentations from my colleagues, Christy Lazicki, uh, the director of impact evaluation at Causal Design, and Jem Yavas, the uh, research associate at 3IE. Um, and after each of these presentations, we're incredibly lucky to be joined by four panelists, uh, two from the implementing partner um, community and stakeholders, and two from the from kind of the research side of our sector uh, researchers. So from the implementing partner side, we have Gary Glass, the Director of Monitoring, Monitoring and Evaluation at Bluemont. And we have Suzanne Amari, the Activity Director for Save the Children's Ideal Activity. And from the researcher side, we have April Knox, the Senior Policy Manager at JPAL. And we have Keith Ives, the, the CEO of Causal Design. Without further ado, I'd, I'd like to uh, introduce to you Dr. Dean Carlin, who is USAID's new chief economist. He was just sworn in a few weeks ago by Samantha Powers. And for those of you um, that may not know Dr. Carlin, he's a distinguished professor, professor of economics at Northwestern University. He's the co-director of the Global Poverty Research Lab at Northwestern University. He's the founder and president of Innovations for Poverty Action, or as many of us know it as IPA. Um, he sits on the executive committee of, at MIT's JPAL, and um, we're thrilled that he's able to join us today and, and provide a, a brief uh, welcome and introduction to this event. So Dr. Carlin, over to you. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Lloyd, for the introduction. Um, I'm happy to be here with all of you today. Wish it could be in person, but hey, it's great that we can all meet this way, at least via Zoom. I understand that the BHA Design, Monitoring, Evaluation, and Applied Learning Division is leading both generation and use of evidence in the Bureau's work. A key objective of the HAEC of activity is to promote a culture of evidence in humanitarian work at and around aid. I could not agree more on the importance of this objective. Humanitarian work of USAID and its partners is some of the most important work we do. Working at the forefront in the thick of crisis to help people on the edge in the most dire of times. I want to leave you with three thoughts today. I'll go into each one in a little bit more detail. First is cost effectiveness and why it is so important to our mission and our ethics. 
Second is beha behavioral insights and how they can help us improve programs, improve cost effectiveness. And third is transparency and coming together as a community to learn. We must get into the weeds on costing and output data and outcome data when we have counterfactuals. We are all in this to help. Some of the help comes from the immediate people we help and some comes from sharing with the knowledge community so that we can do more good tomorrow. Okay, so in order, cost effectiveness. As USAID chief economist, my goal is to help shift resources to the most cost effective use possible, simply put. The extreme setting of humanitarian work makes this all the more important. Suppose it costs us $100 to help someone. If we can get that cost down to $75 for the same benefit to the recipient, we can then spend the full $100 and help 33% 33 more, 33 more people. That's huge. As we all know, USAID's partners are working in some of the worst conditions on earth where the work literally means saving lives. So every life counts. Ironically, even though the benefits of being more cost-effective are the highest, humanitarian, sorry, humanitarian work is also one of the hardest areas to collect data. I get that. But hard does not mean impossible. And if we can figure out how to be more cost-effective now, we can help more people now and even more in the future. That's why I'm excited to open this panel today, to amplify and empower the voices within the agency that are already striving for cost-effectiveness. As in some of my own research on the development end of the spectrum, the challenge of humanitarian settings and ethical considerations around beneficiaries are completely surmountable. We just have to pay attention. Useful research demonstrating causation need not take funds away from beneficiaries, nor does it need to take years for the first findings. In fact, if ethics means helping the most we can for the most people, then I think of data as an ethical mandate, not a wish list or a luxury. The second theme are behavioral insights, nudges. While examples are plenty in development, they apply to humanitarian work as well. Let me be clear, though. No program is going to be centered around a nudge or a behavioral insight. That's not going to be the heart of what how a program is designed and, and rolled out. But one can be improved through understanding a bit of lessons from behavioral insights and nudges. For example, suppose cash is the is the vehicle of of the, that is being that is, suppose the program is is transferring cash to to beneficiaries. Cash, in, in, when it's possible, shows respect and empowers. It's the ultimate localization, letting the person decide for themselves what to do. Obviously, the conditions have to be right to make it work but it also can be a nudge. How is the cash done? Is it a lump sum or is it a string of payments? Do you ask someone to make a plan for how they're gonna spend the money? You don't need to enforce or watch perhaps, but just making the plan might make a difference. It might help them achieve their goals. These are ideas. Um, some evidence would go a long way. Third, we must learn as a community, transparency and sharing. The new evidence gap map is a guide to what we need to know. You will hear about important gaps that USAID and implementing partners can think about plugging, especially in studying systemic interventions like food supply and trade, challenges of measurement in humanitarian settings and study designs are real but surmountable. Our community can also tackle some high level questions, how best to target beneficiaries, finding the right um, set of interventions for different cases, tweaking delivery modalities, keeping an eye on the long-term impact, ensuring feedback loops for staff and participants, and last but not least, localization, how to empower people. And we need more knowledge on even bigger questions, studies, ones that we're not going to get out of micro little micro studies in one spot, such as how to manage food aid so as to reduce, not exacerbate, civil conflict. The answer is undoubtedly depends, and yet the research on this seems stuck in average effects. This is kind of like asking, what is the physical state of H2O? Liquid may be your answer if you just examine the average. But this really misses the point that when it's really hot, H2O is a vapor. And when it's really cold, it's ice. And in between, it is water. Much like that, there's no doubt that food aid can push conflict up or down depending on a plethora of factors, including who receives their aid, how the aid is delivered, the state of the civil war and relative strength of parties and their ties in geopolitics to international donors, etc. This logic also applies to overall impact evaluations. They must be situated and understood in their context in order to have any hope of using evidence from one place to help make decisions in another. Lastly, I want to close with a simple thanks. Thank you for working on some of the toughest problems the world faces with courage and hopefully with a bit of evidence so we can do the most good 
or prevent the most harm as possible now and in the future. Thank you. I wish I could be there with all of you. Um, hope to meet many of you soon. Thank you. So yeah, I, I think he hits the points on what we're hoping to discuss today and underscore what we hope to see as some new priorities under USAID and his leadership in this role. Um, and so without further ado, I'd like to get into the presentation and look at some of these constraints that we've identified at HIAC in the last six to nine months. And so to do that, it's gonna be my colleague who's co-leading this award with me, Christy Lezecki from Causal Design, their Director of Impact Evaluation. So Christy, over to you. Thank you, Roy. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm excited to share with you today what Hayek has learned about overcoming constraints to impact evaluations in humanitarian settings. Next slide. So before I dive in, I'm going to throw a question out to you all to gauge the level of understanding of what are impact evaluations. So if you haven't already, please sign yourself into AHA. And then we'll move on to the question. So my question for you all is what feature determines whether an evaluation is an impact evaluation? Is it about the outcomes that you're measuring? Is it about the methodology used to answer the question? Is it both of those things or neither of those things? All right, responses. A lot of responses coming in. <laughs> and reactions, love, surprise faces, perhaps. Okay, great. So it seems like there is kind of overarching, or, or, or a, lot, a lot of people think both of those aspects are required methodology, a few about the outcomes that you measured. So I'm going to hold you there, and we're going to define what that means in a moment. But I'm gonna move on. Oh, thank you, okay. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the problem that Hayek is trying to solve, which is the significant lack of impact evaluations in the humanitarian sector. And so while the use of impact evaluations to evaluate development programs and policies has increased rapidly, over the past two decades, this growth has really not extended to the humanitarian sector. <laughs> and there is a number of reasons for that, which I'm gonna go through with you in a moment, but ultimately this presents a huge missed opportunity for the sector. A missed opportunity to better allocate resources towards and design programs for some of the world's most vulnerable populations. And we just heard from Dr. Collin that this knowledge is, is really needed right now to answer these critical questions. But why focus on impact evaluations? Impact evaluations are a key tool to understanding program policy and effectiveness, program and policy effectiveness. They rely on methodologies that aim to rigorously establish which outcomes are causally attributed to a program. And so findings from impact evaluations can provide evidence-driven recommendations for, to inform programming decisions. And so I'm gonna now show you a quick video that hopefully helps underscore why impact evaluations are such a critical tool when it comes to wanting to understand program effectiveness. Around the world, Governments and development organizations are running programs to make lives better, to improve learning and skills, to provide clean water, and to promote health and nutrition. But how do we know if these programs are working? <laughs> to get the answer, we have to do an impact evaluation. Okay, what about doing a simple before and after comparison? So these people enrolled in a training program. Nobody had a job before, and everyone got a job afterwards. But maybe it was because the economy improved, and there were simply more jobs available. Nothing to do with our program. Right, so what if we compare people who enrolled in the program with people who didn't? Yet, if someone was motivated to enroll, 
then they're probably more motivated to get a job under any circumstances. So success is because of individual differences, mm. not our program. We need to know what would have happened to the same group of people if they hadn't received the program. Well, that's possible if we could clone people, which we can't. So we need to do something called randomization. Okay, back to our training program. 1,000 people wanted to enroll, but there are only 500 places. So we pick names from a hat. Because we used randomization to assign people to each group, they'll be statistically similar. On average, similar levels of education, similar levels of motivation, and so on. These people get the training program, but these people don't. If the job outcomes here are better than those here, we can reliably attribute that to the program. Using a randomized impact evaluation, we know how effective our program is and can make good, cost-effective decisions about future programs to reduce extreme poverty and build shared prosperity. So hopefully that helps illuminate what impact evaluations are. Again, they rely on methodologies aimed to establish that causal attribution between program and outcome. And they oftentimes do look at long-term outcomes, but they actually don't have to necessarily. But let's pivot to the big question now. Why aren't more impact evaluations done in humanitarian settings? And so Hayek really wanted to dig into this problem to better inform how our award could help address this. And so to do that, we conducted over 60 consultations with implementers, funders, and researchers in this space. And we asked them exactly that. What do you perceive as the key barrier to conducting impact evaluations in these settings? And so we compiled all that data and we organized into a hierarchy of constraints. We identified both demand side constraints, which has to do with the value that stakeholders perceive in, in doing this work, and also supply side constraints, which have to do with having the resources and the inputs required to do the work and the skills work. And so I'm gonna talk briefly about the major constraints that we identified. So on the demand side, the first group of constraints had to do around incentives. So their stakeholders perceive few upsides and a lot of downsides to engaging in impact evaluations. And this is because they're not required by funders, which means that there's additional perceived reputational and financial risks for, for doing this research and finding null results. There's also a lack of awareness of the spectrum of rigor of available evaluation tools. So specifically, there is a misconception that the conventional tool of that pre-post measurement that we saw in the video can answer that impact question. And then we also observed this institutionalized belief in the humanitarian culture that there um, that questions, you know, why divert resources away from aid to research when that aid is clearly valuable. <clears throat> On the, another group of constraints that we identified had to do with execution not being feasible. And so this was driven by a number of factors, including implementers having low bandwidth, um, design challenges such as security constraints or population movements, ethical concerns about the right, uh, ethical concerns about the research design. And then we also observe um, some tensions caused by port, um, poor partnering between implementers and research partners that don't always lead to the best learning outcomes. On the supply side, the constraints that we observe were around funding not being available, and then researchers also not being available, which could be due to low interest or lack of the right skills, whether that be the econometric skills or the contextual understanding. And there's two points that I want to highlight about all of these constraints. So the first is that certainly not all of these constraints are unique to the humanitarian settings. You know, we, we do observe these constraints in development contexts. However, they are certainly amplified in humanitarian settings. And then the second is that while some, um, both 
these constraints are both real and perceived, which means that to tackle these constraints, there's going to require a combination of both actually addressing the constraint, but also awareness building to overcome these misconceptions. <clears throat> And so I'm just going to talk super briefly about how Hayek is aiming to address some of these constraints. Um, if, um, if you would like to get more information, come talk to us after the event, or I also invite you to check out our website. So very quickly, some of the things that we're doing on Hayek is to reduce reputational and financial risk. We are going to be disseminating ongoing impact evaluations to better underscore the value of doing this work to create better partnerships. We're gonna be facilitating partnerships between implementers and researchers that are very implementer focused. And to improve implementer bandwidth, we're developing an online capacity, excuse me, online and in-person capacity strengthening curriculum. To raise awareness about the spectrum of rigor of available evaluation tools, we're developing several myth-busting videos to overcome some of the common misconceptions. And then we're gonna be using or relying on, or focusing on answering operational research questions using A-B testing approaches, both to focus on questions that are top of mind for implementers, as well as a way to overcome those ethical concerns. And then finally, to circumnavigate this short timelines issue, we're going to be highlighting opportunities to work in protracted crises context, which both where this challenge is less salient, but also has a lot of learning opportunities, given that many of these emergencies have been going on for decades, but yet implementers find themselves using the same programs again and again. So, I, but by and large, our most important activity is going to be funding impact evaluations. And we're going to be funding impact evaluations of under research interventions, contexts, and emergencies. And this is our most important activity because Hayek is committed to demonstrating that it is possible to overcome these constraints and that it is possible to provide impact evaluations that are valuable to implementers and, and provide results in a timely way. <clears throat> and so I want to acknowledge that what I've just, the approaches that I've just went through, some of these are the low hanging fruit solutions. And that Hyatt by itself is not going to solve this sectoral issue. What, through these consult, so I want to also highlight some of the thornier constraints that came out in these consultations. And through this process, we've discussed internally some ways that these can be potentially navigated, though they are well outside of the scope of this award. However, we wanted to bring them into the conversation today because we feel it's important to nudge the sector in this direction. So I'm going to talk quickly about three of these bigger challenges. So the first is, how do we actually conduct impact evaluations in rapid onset emergency contexts? I mentioned working in protracted crises, it's easier, and it is in terms of this challenge, but that, that skirts the issue, of course. And so is there a way that we can set up funding mechanisms that allow us to preposition research partnerships and research designs up front so that when emerg an emergency hits, we're ready to go? In fact, causal design is doing this right now on a qualitative evaluation of a Give Directly hurricane relief program, where we set up the methodology and the instruments ahead of time, and once that hurricane struck, we rolled out. However, doing this approach at scale would involve a shift in how funders commission evaluations. The second challenge I want to hit on is poor partnering between implementers and researchers. And we observed a couple different reasons this might be going on. Sometimes there's incentives to work with a certain type of partner. Sometimes implementers aren't aware of the full spectrum of available partners, including private sector partners. And sometimes even in cases where there's awareness and there's interest to work with private sector partners, funding mechanisms are set up in a way that deter those partners from engaging. So all of this points to the need to better educate implementers on the diversity of partners that are available 
And also to utilize funding mechanisms that encourage those private sector actors to enter the market. And then the final challenge I want to hit on is how do we overcome these severe bandwidth constraints that implementers face every day in these settings? And so that we can better generate demand for this type of research. And I want to acknowledge that we did see some success cases in our consultations. We did observe organizations that are better able to manage this constraint. Mercy Corps, IRC come to mind. And both of these organizations have robust centralized research center units that are able to serve as this effective bridge between their, their field staff and research partners. And we're not saying that every implementer needs a centralized research unit, but it's critical that m and &E leaders have the understanding of what impact evaluations are and what is required in order to serve that effective, as that effective bridge. And funders need to better incentivize implement impact evaluations to be done to incentivize that capacity to be built. So I'm going to leave you with those thoughts. Thank you for being here today. And I'll pass it over to Lloyd. Thanks so much, Christy. Um... I'd like to invite our, our panel up to sit. So first we have Suzanne Amari, who is the current acting director for the Ideal Activity, which is actually the parent award to Hayek. Uh, and in her previous role, she led uh, emergency response for safety children. Next up, we have Gary Glass. He's the director of monitoring and evaluation at Bluemont. Um, and so these are our, our, our implementing partner representatives here today on our board. And then from the research side, we're really lucky to have April Knox from JPAL and Keith Ives, the CEO of Causal Design. So welcome you all to the, to the panel. Um, we're going to actually put up some of the questions behind you that are coming in from AHA slides, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start it off with a, with a softball for all of you, if you don't mind. And, and I'd love to just, we can just go down the line. Um, so your immediate reaction to some of these barriers that Christy presented, um, both the, the perceived and the actual, how did those resonate with you and your roles within your organization? Thanks, Lloyd. I think, um, I think it's really the, you know, the time constraint on the rapid onset emergencies, I think is really understandable. Um, but I also, to me, it's not something that I necessarily am concerned about because the vast majority of humanitarian um, response is now in protracted crises. Um, so that, you know, we should center the majority of our research in those areas. Um, I think also the, the time frame for actually being able to use the, the evidence that's coming out of these impact evaluations in a rapid onset crisis is very short. Um, so a lot of times that, that evidence may be used for future similar um, emergencies, but, uh, you know, in a lot of times you, the, the response itself, the activities have moved on. You know, there's a first phase, the second phase, and the longer term recovery. And so being able to, you know, kind of do that rapid adaptation, it may be more that that's, you know, for kind of the greater you know, research, future programming, future planning, preparedness, um, but not necessarily for program adaptation for that particular response that, that you know, would I think that's a great point. That's something we heard a lot in the consultations as well. Is like, how do we use that now? When a lot of this research we're doing is really intended, as Dr. Carlin said, like, not just for improving now, but future iterations, at least on the line. Um, Gary, your thoughts? And with. Uh, <laughs> so the bandwidth, we, we just, the primary focus of my teams and I is safety, security, and effectiveness. When they're, so to get, to divert any of their time away from monitoring our implementation would be, I mean, we just can't do that. So getting the bandwidth organized, getting our organizational structure in a position where we have one centralized person at HQ to be able to work with an independent partner and conduct that impact evaluation, make sure that they have all the information they need to understand our implementation approach and the nuances of each intervention that we have will make us 
people to do that. I'm going to dig in on that a little bit because I know you're going through this right now. Yeah. What's that behavior change been like at Blue Mountain for you to try to do that? Um, the behavior change hasn't been, it's, it's been protective of the field staff. That's what it is. It's protecting the field staff, letting them do their jobs. And currently the HQ team is taking on the brunt of it. And I think that's perfectly fine. That's how it should be. Um, but it comes back to a point that Christy made where IPs have to have the ability and the capacity to be able to speak the impact evaluation language if you're actually going to get it done. You have to know what their needs are. You can't just give them, you know, here's your sampling frame, go forth and conquer. It's not going to work. Um, but you actually have to sit there and, frankly, just be the middle person to go back and forth and explain what's going on. And if that involves uh, taking a little bit more on yourself, that's fine because it allows your teams in the field to do their jobs. Um, and if that can hopefully lead to successful IEs. Well, now over to the researcher side. How was your reaction to those responses, April? Yeah, thanks. Um, I think when thinking about how the impact evaluation field has been evolving over the past few decades, when we saw impact evaluations first emerging, they were on kind of these more traditional development sector approaches, health, education, things that we could think about sort of easily randomizing. But increasingly over the past decade or so, we're seeing impact evaluations really being built into more complex topic areas like governance, peace building, I think now is kind of the time for, for thinking about uh, this approach in humanitarian settings in particular. And I think here it just really starts with showing some proof of concept that impact evaluation is possible, um, that there are ways of bringing implementers and researchers together to creatively design impact evaluations that can respond to these rapid onset crises. And a big part of that, I think, is really establishing strong relationships between the implementing partners and researchers early on to figure out what are the questions that implementers have, what are the big things that they're grappling with, that impact evaluations can really help respond to. Coming up with plans early before crises set to think about what are the programs that are typically being um, implemented in some of these settings where we can develop an evaluation in advance? We can think through what is our research design? What are the questions? What are the population uh, that we might be sampling? What are the triggering events that then can help us put that program in place that has an evaluation plan attached to it? So I think there's a lot of really great potential here, and it's about bringing these two communities together to speak more uh, to find those creative opportunities. Yeah, I, I think all of those findings resonated uh, with the work that we've been doing causal design um, over the years. I, I think the pieces that really stuck out to me, starting with even Dean's uh, talk at the beginning, is uh, complex or complicated or difficult doesn't mean we can't do it. And it should be more of a call to action and a challenge of, and I think most econometricians would get, ex would get more excited over that. Um, this isn't just going to be a straight RCT. We should come up with a, a more creative method um, to solving this problem. Uh, I also think, thinking about you know Gary and your team and, and the teams that we've worked with and other implementing partners, getting more impact evaluators embedded in NGOs and in implementing partners is critical. And, and uh, that's where we've seen the most demand uh, for this come and we've seen the most uh, successful partnerships. And then finally, getting you know the incentives right, getting more staff at USAID who understand this tool and when and how it can be applied. Um, it all, it all makes sense to me. Um, so I'm kind of panning through some of these behind. And so uh, a few comments have come up on, uh, already. We anticipated these about concerns on the ethic and, and the ethics of administrating impact evaluation, specifically randomized impact evaluations um, in these contexts. And so I'd, I'd like to go back to April and Keith a bit on your side from, from the researcher side, your perception of that. and. I'd love to hear a bit about operational research and A-B testing and these alternatives, just to kind of, we're trying to dispel this belief and this myth, because um, we believe it is a, largely a misperception across the industry. Um, and I'd love to hear your examples, and then I'm gonna hand it over to the IP side, because I know that you have your own um, internal political challenges as well. So. Sure, I, I, I'll start. Causal Design's very first study uh, that, that we did was an A-B test in response to uh, Super Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines. In that scenario, we sat down with the implementing partner and we came to the same agreement. Um, no one was gonna 
not have access, uh, no one that would have had access to, to their program and their support would have missed that access. Um, but what we did is we did experiments with dosage effects. Does giving a cash transfer as one large sum, lump sum, $100, have the same effect as giving a family five $20 transfers over a period of months? Um, and, and, and we observed the differences in the outcomes uh, where some were more driven to durable goods, a new tin roof uh, versus others in consumption, increasing the dietary diversity and, and the protein in, the, in that house's uh, diet. We have to understand those items so that when an implementing partner goes in and says, hey, we're targeting food security after this emergency, they know how to get the dosage right. Uh, and, and I think we have ethical concerns of not knowing especially in the cash world, but in a lot of our responses, not knowing what outcomes are being driven by our response. And, and we can do that without withholding from families. Yeah, I, I would echo Keith. I think, you know, we would never want to deny access to services if we know a service is really vital and we have to get it to a population in a timely manner. But we do have a lot of open questions about sort of modalities of delivering services. And so we don't necessarily need to have a pure comparison group when we're thinking about uh, an impact evaluation. You can be testing cash transfers, delivering cash uh, cash in kind versus uh, delivering like a voucher or something of that nature and figuring out is one of those more or less cost effective, does that impact how uh, populations are using that assistance in different ways if it's going to be tied to something versus being unconditional. There's a lot of ways we can be creative and not necessarily denying any uh, access to service. There's also ways we can think about phasing in programs over time. Often it's the case that we can't necessarily reach an entire population uh, that we would like to get access to a service all at once. So can we think about uh, randomizing who gets a service at one point in time and then who gets it a month or two later and look at kind of impacts over time. Um, so I think there's a lot of creative opportunities out there um, and it's just about working together to Mm. And, and the funding that Hayek is hoping to do is very much what uh, April just described. It's more of these operational research questions around, you know, distribution of the frequency of distribution, the dosage, the types, and kind of the alternatives, and what that leads to outcomes. So, um, I know on the IP side, like there's definite internal politics behind, like what does it look like to randomize, and teams get very nervous when we say those words. Um, Suzanne, Ch Gary, could you uh, maybe your own experience on that, how we can try to dispel those myths internally in, in, in our own organizations? Um, so first and foremost, interventions are never designed around any kind of IE. It's based on need. Needs assessments are done to determine what interventions we're doing, how we're going to do and all that. So the onus and the challenge is really on the evaluation team. Sorry. <laughs> uh, that's, that's how it goes. Uh, you got to get creative, and that's why we're here, hopefully, to work with you and help you understand how we're doing. Um, the only way this is going to be successful, like everyone before me has said, um, you got to work together and you got to figure out. Sometimes we'll have interventions where, you know, it's just not possible to do the level of rigor that you want, and that's the deal. That's how it works. Um, so it's basically goes back to everyone's favorite limitations section in any paper you've ever written. It's not going to be perfect. Be honest about it, be realistic, and do what you can. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, with Gary, I think that, that maybe the, a, a little bit the exception to that would be pilots. Mm -hmm. Pilots are a nice favorite way of us to fill in that, you know, research um, at the, you know, with the interventions and with the assistance. And like we were saying before, the vast majority of humanitarian you know, assistance right now is happening in these protracted crises. There is more opportunity for that to think about what interventions can we pilot, can we do the research for, um, and make those adjustments on the way. I think it's still going to be there, you know, in a rapid onset, in, you know, through that, that battle of, you know, trying to, to, to embed the research with with the response is is going to be really difficult, but that's not the, what the majority of work is. Um, so there, there still are. Majority. 
We're, I'm getting the note that we should be done, but I'm gonna I'm gonna pitch one more <laughs> question because there's there's one that really salinated to, to, to rose to the top here, and that's um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna give this one to to April and Gary actually, um, and this is given the short timelines associated with these programs, doesn't it make more sense to invest in impact evaluations at a portfolio level, and if so, what would that take? And so, Gary, I know like. Blue Mounts, you've been working in the same context for a number of years, but many of your programs are kind of, I don't want to say rinse and repeat, but they're refunded over and over. And so just like, what's the value of an impact evaluation in that specific setting? Value for us is that, at least that I can see, is that we will never know, if we don't do it, we're never gonna know. And our teams, like I've said before, we don't have the bandwidth to do it internally. And even if we didn't, do it internally, we don't want to do that because we need to have that objective view. So for us, having the IE in at, let's say, after two years, right? So with BHA's guidelines, you're required to do um, uh, an evaluation after three years of continued programming. It doesn't have to be three years. Something could happen contextually where we would get more benefit out of doing it at a certain point in time. And us having the flexibility to do that allows us to meet that need when it happens. April? Yeah, I think this is where establishing these longer term partnerships <coughs> between implementing partners and evaluation teams is really critical so that as uh, portfolios of interventions are evolving over time, there's kind of this shared knowledge and understanding between uh, teams and building um, kind of capacity within the implementing teams to understand like, where impact evaluations can fit within that work, where new interventions might be emerging, where there's opportunity for evaluation. And I think this is where, when those relationships are longer term and there's kind of this ability to kind of rely on folks, um, then there, there's greater opportunity to be able to then have these kind of planned in advance, knowing that these are kind of interventions that occur time and time and again. And so we can kind of build out the research and evaluation to design earlier. What a great segue for our next panel, because in the next and the next time they're up, we're, we are going to talk about these partner partnering constraints that we've identified. So thank you, panel, for the first round. We'll have you up here again in about 15 minutes. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to uh, my colleagues at 3IE who have undertaken a very robust evidence gap map for us, and we're going to hear some of their, their findings from this. So, Jeff, over, over to you. Thank you very much, Lloyd. So I'm really excited to be here today to discuss with you all the results for the evidence gap map that we have produced and recently completed for the Hayek Award. Perfect. So today I'm going to give a brief overview of Free IE and what an evidence gap map actually is. Then I'm going to go into the background of the EGM and how we created our framework. And then we'll be discussing the key takeaways from what we found. So a bit about Free IE. We're an international NGO which promotes evidence-informed development policies and programs. We work with partners in lower middle income countries to curate evidence and strengthen evidence systems. And since inception, we've managed over 250 impact evaluations and conducted over 40 systematic reviews and 30 evidence gap maps. But what is an EGM? So an evidence gap map is a thematic collection of information about impact evaluations and systematic reviews. An evidence gap map provides a visual overview of existing and ongoing studies in a sector or subsector. And the online EGM, I know the link for our EGM has actually been um, posted in the chat and it will be provided after this presentation too. It can be used to filter studies so that researchers, practitioners, anybody in interest can actually um, identify studies relevant for their specific areas. So how did we develop this EGM? What you can see on the screen here is called a PICO, so Population Intervention Comparison Outcomes and Study Designs, and this is the backbone of any synthesis project. This is effectively the criteria for what are we going to include. So for this EGM, in consultation with BHA and other stakeholders, 
we developed this and I'll just run through a few of the key aspects as to why we would include a study. So in terms of the population, we only included a study if the intervention was implemented in a humanitarian setting in a lower middle income country. If the intervention was implemented in a refugee camp in a high income country, we would have included it, but we didn't actually find anything on those. In terms of the interventions, we took a really broad and multi-sectoral framework. So we included interventions implemented before the onset of an emergency, such as early warning systems, all the way through to those implemented post-emergency, such as nutrition interventions or water security interventions. And for the outcomes, given the focus of Hayek on food security, we looked at the four pillars of food security. So we created 12 outcome types from agricultural production through to composite measures of food security, which looked at the four pillars. So these are food availability, accessibility, utilization, and sustainability. So how do we actually find our studies to populate the map? So for this EGM, we searched 14 academic databases and 44 grey literature websites. We then follow up this by performing forwards and backwards citation tracking. This identified roughly 45,000 records, which we then used machine learning and hand screening based on a study's title and abstract, and then it's full text. We judged the study based against the PCOS I just explained. And once we've gone through that process, we ended up with 146 impact evaluations and 17 systematic reviews in the EGM. So what are the key takeaways of what we found? The first and the main takeaway is that there is rigorous evidence in humanitarian settings. We found 146 impact evaluations and 17 systematic reviews. And what you can see here is that this is a rapidly growing area. So some of the constraints that Christy talked about are being overcome and researchers and implementers are finding ways to conduct these sorts of evaluations. In the past five years, the evidence base has actually tripled and the number of for 2022 here only reflects a mid-year figure considering we conducted our search in June. There's a good chance that actually um, that figure could be the peak um, for what a single year figure for publications. So, despite finding evidence, it spread thinly across different interventions and outcomes. So what you can see here is an evidence gap map. The um, horizontal axis shows the intervention types, whereas the vertical axis has the outcome types. The dark blue bubbles represent impact evaluations and the light blue represent systematic reviews. The online EGM is an interactive version of this map where you can filter studies and when you click on the bubbles, it will come up with those studies. So it's really easy to find the actual evidence you're interested in. So when we look at the map, what we really find is there's two main clusters of evidence. The majority of what we find is on food, cash and other in-kind transfers. And I think just based on the discussions we've already have, you can tell this is where a lot of um, work and implementation is focusing on. Within that group itself, we actually find that 57 of the 79 evaluations are cash transfers. So even within that group, cash transfers are the main focus. The only other real cluster of evidence is on multi-component interventions, which is simply where an intervention is, they're combined. So if you were to provide cash and food together as opposed to separately. So the geographical spread of our evidence is broad. We find at least one impact evaluation for every world region, which includes a low and middle income country, but it's also really clustered. So the majority of evaluations took place in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, only four countries had 10 or more impact evaluations and three of those were in sub-Saharan Africa. And even more concerning is that there are certain countries where we really think there should be evidence, but where we don't find any. So this highlights the top map shows a risk index for a country in 2023. What's the likelihood they're going to face a humanitarian emergency? Whereas the bottom map is a food security index. When you overlay these with our findings, there are actually 13 countries which are both food insecure 
and at a higher risk of an emergency where we have no evaluations whatsoever. And there's a further seven where there's only one or two impact evaluations. So when we look at what is the emergency these interventions are responding to, as discussed already, the majority of it is in a protracted crisis. We find very little evidence on rapid and sudden onset emergencies. Um, conflicts make up the largest single emergency type. And in terms of natural hazards, drought was the only one we identified with more than 10 studies for earthquakes, tsunamis, volcanoes. We found no um, evidence whatsoever. So given the focus of this map, all populations targeted could be are considered vulnerable, but emergencies don't affect everyone equally. There are certain populations which may face restrictions in access to aid or may be disproportionately affected by um, crises. So we looked at what information we have on this. And what we find is there's a small evidence base on a number of different populations, such as children, refugees, or older people, where interventions are directly targeted and designed to be accessed by these groups. And finally, our last main point today is that anticipatory action, so the design and the um, implementation of interventions before the onset of an emergency is a growing body of literature. Um, we found 23 studies of this and out of them 18 have been published since 2015. So the three main takeaways that we have, there is an evidence base, rigorous evaluation does exist in these settings and it's growing rapidly. Despite this, it's sped thinly across interventions and outcomes food cash and in-kind transfer is where that is by far the majority of what we find. And there are also limited evidence on the effects of interventions in many countries and for many emergency types. So what's next for the EGM? The results will be used by the Hayek team as a basis for future work going forward. But outside of um, Hayek, there are two paths the EGM could take. So the evidence base we've identified could be used to then explore the impact of these interventions through a systematic review. Um, although we did identify relatively recent and up-to-date systematic reviews, I cannot stress enough, this is a really growing body of evidence. In 2022 alone, we have 10 um, impact evaluations on cash transfers. So those systematic reviews published just last year on this topic may be missing vital information. And then that leads me to my second point, which is that this could grow into a living synthesis project. So like I said, this is a rapidly growing body of evidence and ensuring that we keep this map up to date. So researchers, practitioners, implementers have access to this is really vital. And that is all from me, and I will hand back over to Lloyd. I'd like to invite our panel back up. We have about 20 minutes to continue this conversation. Um, we're going to go in reverse order here. We'll start with, uh, with Keith. When you see the results of this EGM and others, um, what jumps to mind in terms of the the practicality and usability of this? Like, how would you, as a researcher, use the use the CGM? Yeah, uh, you know, I'd start with the concentration of findings on cash. Um, you, maybe the opposite, you know, one point of the gap map is to look for the gaps. Uh, but when we're working with partners, we're often helping them make decisions on how to use an evidence base. And I, I think, again, we have an enormous and continuously growing evidence on cash and we need to be pointing more implementing partners to that and saying, hey, we don't, probably don't need to do another study uh, on, on this dosage effect in, in Kenya. Uh, we already know uh, for the most part what's happening here and getting them to leverage that for decision making. That's the first point is, is getting the implement, implementing partners to use existing evidence to make decisions um, and then identifying some of, of, of these gaps. I think geographically, uh, harder for me as, as the researcher but when I'm talking to implementing partners and I'm talking to, to donors and staff at USA, pointing to some of these, these countries that we see um, empty, 
blank on the map and going, hey, let's let's really push for something here. Let's start to let's start to poke at this and see uh, see what we can dig up. Suzanne, I'm going to pitch that over to you from the IP side. Like, you know, in outside of what Keith described, how how Save the Children or other implementing <laughs> partners could use this type of information. Yeah, I mean, I think the the faster we can get from novel research to best mm -hmm. practice, the better it is for the implementing community. So, the you know, getting more of those you know systematic reviews that you know do raise up the you know things that we can then start to apply in our programming. I think that's really where you know I you know it, as an implementer would want to concentrate you know the energy um, to to making sure that as we're designing new programs things that we are applying those those best practices and and you know more so necessarily than you know making sure in our programs that we're doing that new you know, kind of yeah. April, anything to add to that? Yeah, I, I would definitely echo uh, what Sophie said. I think also in thinking about where we do have concentrations in literature, like the cash research, for instance, trying to figure out where there might even still be gaps there in thinking about um, you know, how cash is targeting different populations, for instance, how it might impact inter-household dynamics. I know there's sort of literature in thinking about cash and women's agents like that. So maybe there are still some gaps in there. So to say, you know, although there is this big body of, of research on cash, are there things we still don't know there? And then I think I would just echo that, looking at then where there are gaps in other areas and where we can, can push more for research uh, to, to start to pull some of those. I'm going to tweak it a bit for you, Gary. So we actually had this conversation. I was surprised anybody. We tried to prep our panelists with questions yesterday uh, with, with Suzanne. We were talking about cash. And we were like, there's been so much research around cash, especially over the last 10 to 15 years. Um, but we've also seen a big change in how people perceive cash. Like, I remember 15 years ago, everyone was like, we're just going to give cash to people. Like, what are they going to do with it? Are they going to go buy a bunch of booze and go party or what? And right, it really took a lot of evidence to kind of move past those those belief barriers. So somehow cash got it right or the research behind cash did it right. Um, your thoughts on how that happened? Like, I mean, especially I know Blue Mountain does a lot of cash. Like how, how what was, what has been that kind of that change over time and how this evidence helped structure or change it for Blue Mountain? I mean, a lot of it comes from, it's, it should, it's proof, that's the whole point. And everyone's bought into it because it's objectively verifiable. The evidence are there, the data are there, um, the successes are there. The one thing that I still am curious about is how do cash interventions or anything related to cash affect different parts of the market and in terms of unintended outcomes. And I'm not talking about the successes. We're talking about are there any kind of negative outcomes that we talk about best practices and everything being positive but how does it affect in, in any way different parts of market um, and that's one of the things that, that is still i'd like to just see more about that um but again bandwidth <laughs> we, don't, we, we don't always have it um to look into it as deeply as we look i'm gonna make one plug here too as somebody who's written a lot of proposals as a proposal writer for MBD teams, man, would I love to have an EGM like that as I'm going to draft up a proposal. <laughs> like, I think it's a great use. I know it's not necessarily the research use, but it's a gold mine for that. Um, I'm, we're gonna jump back to one of the constraints that, that Christy had uh, around partnerships. And so, uh, you know, she identified that there is, there is a misalignment of partnerships. And this was flagged both from our consultations with researchers and with IPs, and that all these research partnerships don't always go swimmingly well. Some do for a bunch of really good and well-planned reasons. But um, I'd like to start with, with Keith on your perception of how that, how that partnership model between implementing partners and researchers can be improved um, yeah. in, the, in the coming years of our work. Yeah. I think we, we've touched on a couple of times today kind of the evolution of impact evaluation um, over the years, over the decades now. And I do think we're in this kind of IE 2.0, maybe 3.0. Uh, but when it started, this was an academic research activity led by um, now Nobel laureates, <laughs> you know, for investments in that work. 
Um, today, the tool is more mainstream. Uh, there, there are there are a larger you know body of practitioners, uh, but I think that we also have a more diverse um, pool of, of vendors or providers, and a lot of the implementing partners that we work with um, have worked with academic partners, quasi-academic um, you know think tanks, who are really well positioned and incentivized to try and tackle those big hairy questions. Um, the, the big unknowns and answer them, answering them in a way that's going to attempt to prevent or pre, uh, present some generalizable um, evidence. Causal design, and I think a lot of the private sector research firms that have entered um, over the last decade uh, are often I think, better positioned for these A-B tests for conducting studies that are, that are resulting in immediate decision making. Um, what are you going to do in your program tomorrow or next year? Uh, and, and often aren't incentivized by the notoriety uh, or the publication. You know, at Calls of Design, uh, we never s submit our impact evaluations to a journal, an academic journal. And, and because of that, we also don't have to follow the trends of those journals and what they're looking for demanding. We get to focus on the question that the NGO or the implementing partner has um, and helping them make their decision. And I think getting as, a, as, a, as an implementing partner, when you're going to find your research partner, finding the partner that has the incentives that are in, aligned to, to succeed in your context is, is really critical. And I think some misalignment has led to conflict and yeah. poor experiences. And I'm going to hand this over to April, but some of the things popping up behind you here are actually like, you know, how do we do program, like, wouldn't it make more sense for, again, these programmatic reviews? And another question was, these are some of these questions that we've talked about have been very minor or small like operational decisions and not overarching questions um which in my experience probably lends itself more to an academic approach um so yeah from from j pal and where you sit what, how do you feel about those those partnerships yeah i mean i think one thing that today is making clear is there's this huge need for more research in this space and i think there's room for a lot of and actors, and I think there's room for some of these like, big generalizable generalizability questions, and for more of like the one-off program evaluation as well. And so it's kind of finding a balance between all of those things. And I think where the academic side can kind of step in is I think you know there's a real focus on learning there. And I think one thing that maybe came out in some of the challenges too is this kind of tension between learning and accountability sometimes. And I think. Um, a lot of the incentives around publishing and things like that are around producing new, innovative knowledge on things that we really like, don't know that much about, and so kind of pushing the boundaries there. And so I think that's, you know, one of the areas that the academic side can kind of like help step in. Um, but I think the other thing at, at JPL that we're really focused on is like building the capacity of implementers to do this themselves, recognizing like it, it can't just be the academic community, it can't. It can't just be the other like research centers out there. Like it really, we need to help folks within these organizations understand these methods themselves um, in order to really create fruitful research partnerships. So we focus a lot on training, um, on uh, kind of incubation of ideas uh, to kind of build this capacity across the, a wide <laughs> range of actors, and so that it's not just being within the academic. Uh, yeah, and from the, let's just keep coming down the line on this. I'm, I, I like from the from the IP side, like you know, identifying partners and those that are aligned with your team and providing you the input and support. Um, yeah, Gary, you're. That comes down to the scope of work. Um, when we write that, that's. I mean, I find myself getting jealous of the work they're going to do when I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm writing it. I'm like, oh, this sucks. I don't want to do this, uh, and I know I'm not going to. But it's it's really interesting, and it's. It's great work, but again, the biggest thing for uh, for me is flexibility. Um, we need to be able, you know, I don't I don't need um, I don't need a, a subject matter expert necessarily in a specific sector. I need someone who can think outside the box from an organization that can work in these very difficult operating environments. Can work with us understanding the restrictions and limitations of what we have, and doing again the best we can, knowing it's not it's not going to be a standard RCT. It's not going to be what everybody wants it to be, but we're going to get as close to what we can as we can. And then it comes to us, the IP is communicating that to our teams and making sure that everything that comes back to us is usable and then actually used. It doesn't need to sit on a dusty shelf somewhere and never be opened. That's from my dissertation. Yeah, 
<laughs> well, speaking of usability, I mean, so I didn't do an overview of IDEAL, but IDEAL is a global learning mechanism for, for BHA in terms of taking these findings and these partnerships and ensuring their usability across uh, the plethora of IPs. Uh, like, Suzanne, what's kind of your response to, to this? Yeah. Can, can I answer the Absolutely. partnership please, question? Please. <laughs> yeah. Because I feel like the thing that we've, we missed talking about, and I appreciate you, Paul, you talking about, um, the, you know, the building capacity of implementers to do the research themselves, but there's also a huge number of local researchers, local institutions, local universities that often are overlooked in terms of partnerships. When you look at the big food security programs, that are implemented by an international NGO, and then it's a big name university that is doing a lot of the research, and you're missing out on the local knowledge that there is to be, um, that, you know, maybe, you know, that person who's sitting in DC is not going to catch the nuance um, that a local researcher would. Um, so just making, you know, in, you know, terms of developing those partnerships, things it's really important that we're not looking at a landscape that is the people in this room, um, but is is also, you know, more, more local. Um, but to, yeah, to usability, um, I, I mean, it really is, we, um, you know, for IDEAL, I'll, we do a lot of work on data for decision making. So it's not just about the data gathering um, and the research for the sake of research. It's the so what. So what are we going to do with this? How is it going to be applied? And, and getting it into you know, a 100-page research report <laughs> um, on, you know, from an impact evaluation is not going to get implementers to use it. Maybe Gary would be <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it's 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 so it's you know making sure that we are getting to you know the really salient points and not just the you know this is what worked and what didn't but then how do you apply that so in, into future programs how could you adapt um, so I think it's for that's where the partnership between researchers and implementers is really important to get some of that applicability of, of what the research is. And that's a great segue into what I think will be our last question, and I'd love to hear from all four of you on it. It's, it's something that uh, April actually just touched on, but we haven't we haven't addressed it yet today. And it's one of the biggest findings that Christy and I have found out of our consultation, and, and this is this tension between accountability and learning, and 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 the belief that many impact evaluations are actually an accountability mechanism and, and not a learning mechanism. Um, and as a result, there is some, some tension, both on, the I, both on the researcher side and the implementing partner side. So I'm gonna keep it with you, Suzanne, and we'll go back down the line, but I'd love to just hear your thoughts on how to dispel the myth that IEs are always an accountability. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, that's hard. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I think that the, the impact part of it is, is, you know, probably the, the big thing there of, you know, the, the perception that, um, what you're doing is measuring how well your program is, um, you know, meeting the objectives that it like initially laid out to, which is, you know, not what an impact evaluation is necessarily going to be. So that, I, I think there's, you know, the, the work that you're going to be doing of, of um, better understanding of what impact evaluations are and what, you know, they, they can be is there. But there's, there's always, I think, uh, a fear when you do any kind of evaluation of, like, what if this shows that we're just not accomplishing anything or we're doing something bad and then and then what like so it's sometimes it's like the the thought might be like it's better just to keep that in the dark you know than to to actually dig in and see you know like is this 
actually working? Because if no one else is asking you to do that, then why? Uh, we have plenty of accountability between internal monitoring, third party monitoring, and you name it. People are looking at everything, and that's where it's just one more layer. Monitoring teams are always perceived as the police by the programs teams who are implementing it. So you've got a little little risks there, here and there, but the impact evaluations are what allow us to have an actual constructive conversation from the HQ team to the field team and understand what actually has happened. It doesn't have to be sunshine and rainbows. It's fine if it's if there are some things that are not positive, because um, otherwise we're not going to learn. And, and no, no or little impact is still better to understand than to just let it continue. And the only way we're going to be able to do anything about it is by identifying. So. Yeah, I think right here, this is where thinking about like really thoughtful research design comes in and recognizing that impact evaluation it isn't necessarily just meant to tell you like, yes, something works or no, it doesn't, but it's meant to really get at the how and why programs are working. And so they're having a really strong theory of change behind a program, setting that out in advance of why you think a sort of like a causal chain of a program can work in developing the research design around that, you can get a lot of really rich information. And even if ultimately you find the program isn't working, you might get really insightful reasons as to why that's happening. Where is that theory of change breaking down? Keep final words from you before we wrap up the panel. All right. I think I have three pieces. One is for the donors out there, the USA contract and award officers. Um, stop conflating the two. Uh, and, and going, oh, an impact evaluation isn't viable, let's use a performance evaluation, and then asking your evaluator to tell you, tell you what the impact was from a performance evaluation. I think that's led to part of this problem. Um, impact evaluations have a lexicon problem. It's research. We should call them impact research. <laughs> but we call them impact evaluations, and it leads to a lot of confusion here. The, the second piece is I think we need to do more, more horse races, those A-B tests, where we're, it's, it's very clear to the implementing partner, we're not saying whether or not this worked, we're saying which intervention worked better. And then the final piece, I was really excited to see, I know our whole staff uh, was USAID add cost evaluation or cost analysis um, to any impact evaluation of some of USAID funding. I, I think the, the final way we move away from this sounding like accountability and it being clear that this is about research and effectiveness is to actually do the cost analysis and start talking about impact evaluation from a, a, a matter of how do we become more efficient and you know dollars per outcome or dollars per output uh, instead of did this work? Which cycles us right back to what Dr. Carlin was talking about in our opening. Um, so with that, I, I'd love to have a round of applause for our panel. Thank you. Um, so we've got about 10 minutes here to wrap up. I, I, I wanted to note a few calls to action from the ideal side. So for those of you in the room that are, you know, interested in how you can engage more, sorry, not engage more with HIAC under ideal is if you're, if you're a part of a BHA emergency food security activity, we are going to be dropping what we're calling an RFR request for research in January. So we have a, a pot of money around um, that will be funding impact evaluations up to $225,000 per impact evaluation. And obviously there can be cost shares to expand the size of that, et cetera. Um, but we'd love to start in our own small way, filling and plugging some of these gaps that have been identified. Um, but we also treat this as a proof of concept. We wanna demonstrate that there can be cost-effective, timely impact evaluations done in these settings. Um, so that's really a big part of Chrissy and I's role over 2023. Um, if you're a non-funded emergency food security award, uh, we are offering a service around evaluability assessments. So while we can't fund you directly to do your research, we'd encourage you to come talk to us, go through kind of the application process in a, in a way. And at the end, we'd hand you a document with uh, whether or not we think it's feasible or appropriate to do an IE. Because let's be clear, like even though we've talked all about IEs up here, IEs should not be done on every award in no way, shape or form. There are times and that it's appropriate and times it's not, and we will be very upfront with you um, on those times. And if it is the time, we'll recommend methods, potentially link you with researchers that could support that. 
and, and maybe even point you in the direction of some, some uh, funding opportunities. Um, and then if you're an ongoing or completed humanitarian in, uh, award that has done an impact evaluation, we have an amazing KM Com teams. Katie, raise your hand in the back there. She works on our award. She is a wizard and we are leveraging graphic design. We wanna lift up your research. We want to let the community know that these are happening, that it is out there and these are results. So we're kind of what we're, you'll find some on the table out there from a recently completed save or undergoing, it's not completed, save the children impact evaluation uh, in Venezuela. Um, actually, Dean Carlin is the PI on that, but we're calling them research and action briefs. And we'd love to share those and disseminate those with the community. Um, and we can take that lift off your shoulders to do that. Uh, so those are really the big ways to engage with us. Of course, we're always open to coffee brainstorm about uh, talking about methods and, and, and whatnot as well. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't take an opportunity right now to thank two people who are actually not in the room today. And so those two people are uh, Arif Rashid, who is now the division director for DMIL at BHA, and Adam Trowbridge, who was our AOR for our award. He uh, is actually just moving on to a new role um, in the, uh, the US government. And Hayek is largely their brainchild that they talked about and thought about and discussed for years before it finally came to real being. And so um, from us at Hayek, we just really appreciate that they put the energy and effort out there to make this initiative happen. Um, and then last and foremost, without further ado, I wanna make sure I'm getting everything here. Oh, everybody in the room and online will be sharing a number of resources at the end. So obviously we'll share our decks. Um, we'll give you a link again to the EGM that is live now. Um, you can find it on 3IE's website. It was dropped in the chat. Um, and then in an email next week, we'll make it super clear it's up front. Tread with caution. As somebody who dove into these EGMs, it is a rabbit hole of total enjoyment. And I wasted a good five or six hours of a day just going into some of these studies. It, it is completely fascinating. Um, so you, and we'll also be sending out next week a, a very short evaluation. We'd love to hear what you learned, what we should have done different, you know, all the typical things because we are ME practitioners, so we want to improve. Um, so those are the follow-ups from us. Of course, if you want something else, you can always write us. Uh, IX website, you'll have that. You can contact Christy or I. Um, but with final words, I'd love to introduce our, our new AOR. Um, she's not new to our award though, because before you were our AOR, she was our, our alternative AOR, but Mara Maradini from, from BHA is gonna do our closing. So over to you, Mara, thank you. Um, just a couple words, everyone. Thank you so much for those of you who joined in person. It's great to see some familiar faces and connect uh, again. Um, those of you who joined online, thank you so much for tuning in. We really appreciate it. Uh, BHA is really excited for this research. So I encourage all of you to keep your eyes out for the, the dropping of that request for research that Lloyd re uh, referenced. If you need more information, go to the FSN website. You can learn more about HIAC and the three steps of the application process. Um, I want to emphasize that, that some of you may have read the emergency application guidelines and may remember there's that statement that says BHA may consider impact about funding impact evaluations. And you may have thought, you know, you may have had one of two thoughts. One, like, oh, this is so exciting. I can't wait to do this or, oh gosh, this seems like BHA doesn't really want this and we're just gonna let that go. So this is a great opportunity to take advantage of that we may fund this uh, because you are working with a team, with this HIAC team, who's extraordinarily knowledgeable on impact evaluations. <laughs> Not only that, they're doing a lot of the legwork for you. They are looking into the industry to find experts in impact evaluations who can work with you on developing and designing these evaluations in addition to building capacity within that industry as well. So I encourage you to reach out to HIAC to think about the kinds of work that could possibly be done in the programming that you're launching, um, and I look forward to, to seeing those results. Um, I think with that, uh, we'll close. Those of you who are here, please hang out, have some lunch, um, 
meet new people, talk with us. <laughs>